David Spada is a successful attorney whose dream was to become a sports talk show host. Elliot Harris is a Chicago sports columnist who wanted to expand his media presence. In the next hour, they combine their talents and love of sports and women by interviewing former professional athletes and lovely ladies on sports and torts. But keeping the boys out of trouble isn't always easy because when David and Elliot are together, they have more fun than should be legal. Greetings and welcome to another edition of Sports and Torts on TalkZone.com with David Spada and Elliot Harris. Last time I checked, I'm Elliot Harris, so that means David Spada is either the invisible man or since today is February 14th, he may be doing some last-minute Valentine shopping for flowers and or candy. We have a great show today. We will have bikini competitor Samantha Slavin later in studio. But first, we have Pro Football Hall of Famer Charlie Joyner. I see you started your college career at Grambling. Did Eddie Robinson yeah. recruit you personally, or did you just decide I wanted to play for him? No, he didn't recruit me. I recruited by my high school coaches because both of them played for Eddie Robinson. And back in those days in Louisiana, it's uh, in high school, even a black high school in Louisiana, the coaches either played for Eddie Robinson or they went to Grambling. So naturally, you were going to Grambling when you graduated from high school. He didn't have to come out and recruit. He just was going. So Eddie Robinson didn't even need to recruit. He, he, he knew he could get the best black ball players. They, yes, they, they would just come to him, right? Oh, yes. It was, that's what it was in Louisiana back then in those days. When he was going real good, he's real powerful, real strong. He had been in Grambling for about uh, maybe 25, 30 years. Maybe, yeah, about 25, 30 years. So he was pretty well established within the city because almost everybody went to Grambling. A subject in the right to the down in Louisiana, the two black schools. So, naturally, the black high school, they had a to get most of the best athletes. So, they either, like I say, either coached the principal or the athletic director or what, or they, or they went around as student athletes, as students. Now, what was playing for Eddie Robinson like? Uh, it was a joy to play for him. He was tough. He coached for eight, had a very long practice. I think you really, I think you really got your, got your heart compete. He tells you, you know, no living like you're happy, like you're happy. You got to talk all the time, all the time. He's a great, he's a great coach, a great coach, a great coach. And, you know, he made me, he's, 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 you play, you would play either on the offense or defense side of the ball, side of the ball. Well, the, well, the only time I went from one side to side and both the other, the other went, I was went, I was a freshman, man. and we had we had a looking, a looking for 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 Steve, uh, freshman. I was on a low look team. That ain't that's when I went. I was trying to be a low look team, team, and we play offense, we play offense, and we see on the on put the defense on the offense. So I so look, I played, I played the spot. When I when I also started, started playing, which is my sophomore year. I uh, only played one spot. Was the transition from high school to college fairly e- easy for you? From high school to coach to college? From time to yes, sir. Oh, that was a trust. That, that was a tough transition for me uh, uh-huh. because I don't know. I, I, you know, I was a small guy. I weighed about 185 pounds, and then I go to grandma just <laughs> some enormous, massive people. And I'm just saying to myself, well, what am I doing? You know, she's big, I'm just too small, I won't survive. But it was just the the, the size of the guys got there. That's all the grandma. Because grandma has big, big people. They had 300 pounds before the 300 pounds became popular. At Grambling, was it a passing offense more or a running offense? Or was it pretty uh, uh, balanced? No, we were over running offense. But we, when we got to James Harris, like we both were freshmen together, we started playing. We started throwing the ball just a little bit more. But basically, Grandma was a Russian offensive team. We ran the wing T, I can tell you that. We didn't have a split out wide receiver. Now, you, you were part of uh, the 1968 Grambling Morgan State game, which uh, CBS Sports had a documentary about uh, highlighting historically 
black uh, talented. What was that like? And that was uh, that was a pretty good experience for us. You know, we were a bunch of small guys, some small college guys from uh, Louisiana. We had never been out the state as far as say we've been as Tennessee, something like that. And they had to go there by bus. But we get a chance to play this game in, in New York and uh that dog we had to jump on an airplane, we couldn't couldn't drive the bus that far, so they get on the airplane, so that was a new experience for us. And plus we were playing somebody that we had now have never played before, which is another new experience for us. And uh, we kinda of enjoyed that and we um we relished the right to be the first one to do it. And I think it it became a kind of a mm, I, 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 I don't know what you can call it, but um, yeah. I don't know. Just a little event, that's all. But it was a big event for us. When you got drafted by the Houston, the Houston Oilers, did you think to yourself, okay, I'm going to the AFL, I'd rather play in the NFL because it was more of an established league? No, uh-uh, because most of the people that used to train us and be with us was uh, in the NFL, I mean in the AFL. Willie Brown played for the Denver Broncos and Oakland Raiders. You know, he he was a grandma knight, and he would always come back and coach us and uh, doing spring training. And Nehemiah Wilson was also in the AFL. In the, in the AFL. And uh, Gold Phillips was in the AFL. All of the guys that we played with at Grandma that were playing professional football in, they were all in the what, AFL. And there was very few in the NFL. But I think the only guy that went to the NFL was Henry Dye. He went to the Rams. But almost everybody else, like Goldie and Willie Brown and uh, Nehemiah Wilson and all of the guys we played with, they were all in the AFL. So going to the AFL, it was kind of a treat for me. Being drafted in the fourth round, was, was that better than you expected, worse than yeah. you expected? What were, you at, what were you anticipating when the draft came around? <laughs> Just to get drafted, really. Just to get drafted. <laughs> I really did. I, I, you know, I, I wasn't expecting her to be, you know, to get picked up high. I knew I was going to get picked up high. Um, but being the fourth pick in the second round, the second pick in the fourth round, it surprised me that I got up that high. And uh, the reason why is because I think a, fr- a friend of mine who was an assistant coach at Brown who became a scout for the youth and all of his name was Tom Williams. I think he drafted me that high, you know. And I, from this day on, and God bless Tom so I know he's in heaven now. I always thank him for taking me on because he got me just a couple of dollars of more bars where I could help my parents out. You mentioned that your quarterback at Grambling was James Harris. Can you imagine James Harris played in today's NFL? I mean, he would be getting a huge contract, and they would have utilized all his skills. Uh, yeah, he just came along the wrong time, that's all. He was born too soon. That's what Ed Rob used to tell us all the time. You were born too soon. Because in but, back then, they wanted him to just be a pure drop-back passer, right? Oh, he was a, back, he was a drop-back passer. He was not a runner, no. He wasn't a, wasn't a move-around guy like the guys they have today, but he was a pl- classic drop-back passer with a great arm and great accuracy. Very good player. With the Oilers down there in Houston, with the Oilers down there in Houston, when you're with them, was it a more open style of play than we're used to at Grambling? Oh no, uh-uh. it was almost the same. That's that's pretty good. Because back then the coaches used to all, all the time with Water Lim, and he was, he was a basic, you know, run the ball for him, run run the ball to set up the pass, run the ball to set up the pass. But he was pretty good, though. And, 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 and at the time I was with him, I was also drafted as a defensive back, too. So I didn't play wide receiver full-time until I got until about my third year there. Who made the decision to make you a defensive back? Because you didn't play defensive back really in college, you told us. That was Tom Williams. That was the guy who used to coach the freshman team when I was a defensive back on the look team at my freshman year. He was the, head, he was the coach of the look team. So I was playing defensive back then. And uh, I guess he thought that I could play defensive back because he was a coach at Grumman then. And then uh, you and Flag Little uh, on the football field. Like what? Your friends, you get knocked out tackling Floyd Little? <laughs> for a little? Yeah, for a little once he got knocked me out of a game. But believe me, I was the only artist two times. Two times. Floyd Little and uh, Tom Jackson. 
That's only two people that would knock me out of a game. Those are two pretty good football players there who knocked you out. Damn good football players. You know, one is uh, one is in the Hall of Fame, and then the other one should be in the Hall of Fame, as good as he was. Do you ever thank Floyd Little and say, thanks for knocking me out because of you, I became a wide receiver, and that's why I'm in the Hall of Fame? That surely helped, I tell you. That surely helped me, but I never told him that. <laughs> I don't know if I ever will, but that, that, that got me to be a full-time wide receiver. Speaking of the Hall of Famers, after a couple seasons in Houston, he got traded to the Cincinnati Bengals, and uh, Paul Brown is the coach. What yeah. was he like? Uh, he's um, very stern, very, you know, very, you know, very stern. You know, he ran it with a kind of ran that ship with an iron fist. Um, he's very intimidating the way he talks to you. Um, but he's one of the most knowledgeable men. Well, he knew how to pick talent. But Paul Brown, you know, he, he has some great coaches behind him, so he's always, you know, he can always, he, he can always have that threat over you of losing his job. So he, 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 he was a good job. Good for the system. He was good for the league, and and um, he was good for discipline because he's always scared the hell out of me. Was he still coaching at that time, or is he just a figurehead? And his assistant coaches were doing more of the work. Uh, he had the title of head coach, but I think Bill Walsh did most of the stuff. Bill Walsh and Bill Johnson. And uh, G.D. Donaldson, who's the back, offensive backfield coach, that was all on that associated with the defensive coaches, Chuck Weber. I don't know if I didn't approach him very well, but the offense, I think Paul Brown was the head coach, and Bill Johnson was the offensive coordinator, and Bill Walsh and uh, G.D. J.D. Uh, Donaldson, they almost did everything else. He was not an active coach. He was the head coach by name. So with the Bengals, you had a pretty pretty good passing game. You had uh, Ken Anderson at quarterback. Another receiver was Isaac Curtis. Right. Uh, what, what was that like? That that, that allowed you to get good, open. A very good passing group that Bill Walters put together right there. Um, it was myself, Isaac Curtis, and Chip Myers were the wide receivers. Bob Trumpy uh, with the tight end. So Bob Trumpy was one of the fastest tight ends I've ever seen. And he, you know he wasn't as big. He wasn't. Big. One of the tight ends, but he was really fast, and he was more of a receiver than he was a blocker. But we had a real good passing game. Canals was an extremely accurate passer, very accurate. And he should be in that Hall of Fame also. But uh, our passing game in, uh, in Cincinnati was very good. I, I think the complete, com- completion percentages were always high every year I was there. Did you realize at that time that Bill Walsh would make a great ha- head coach and become what he became all those years with the 49ers? No, I did not. I didn't think he <laughs> you know, he said Bill Walsh was kind of a jovial guy. You know, he likes to kid around with the players sometimes. He likes to laugh and joke with them sometimes. Although he got real serious about football when time for football came. But other than that, he was real Joe. He, he wasn't a, he wasn't the type that you would think going to be a great one of the greatest coaches of all time. You just didn't think that when you when we were in Cincinnati. But hey, uh, you know he's got the mind and he put it to work. And, and I believe that personality in San Francisco did not change from that same personality he was in Cincinnati. So a, a couple seasons, three seasons in Cincinnati, then you get traded to the Chargers. And, you know, Air Coriel's in high gear with Don Coriel, the coach. What was your anticipation going to San Diego? Uh, the anticipation, that was a, a hell big deal. You know, San Diego had a wealth of first-round draft picks. And second-round picks had Louis, uh, Louis Kelcher, Big Hands Johnson, Woodrow Lowe. had a bunch of guys. They had a lot of talent there. And all they did was just, well, they just needed somebody to put it all together. And, um... Coach Pluto was the coach there, and uh, from what I heard, he was a very, very smart man. And what really sold me on making it, making this a real good move was the fact that we hired Bill Walsh to be the offensive coordinator in San Diego the same year I got traded there. And with Walsh going there, I knew that's the place that I wanted to go also. So you had two great offensive minds there, and Don Coriel and Bill Walsh. I mean, they had to make it a lot easier on you guys because you knew, listen, these guys know what they're doing. 
Oh, yeah. Well, look, uh, now, Wal- Coriel and Walsh did not work together, okay? Oh, okay. Walsh came in for one year as coordinator, one year as coordinator, and then he left to go to be the head coach at Stanford University. And then from Stanford, he went on to San Francisco. So when did Coriel come in? Coriel came in in 70, 76, 78. Okay. Yeah. And then you had... Hit- Walsh was gone, but Walsh was gone by then. And I mean that offense in San Diego in the late seventies, early eighties. I remember Dan Fouts running back was Chuck Muncie, John Jefferson, and you at receiver, Kellen Winslow at tight end. I mean you had all pros at every position. Yeah, Korea. I mean Korea did an excellent job of getting some very, 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 very good skilled players. The five skilled positions. I think we had the best in the. At the five, at the six skill positions, I think we had the best players in the league at that time. How quickly in your career did you realize that you could be somebody special? You know, more than just an average player in the NFL. Uh, I don't know. I never thought. I just, I just go out there catching balls. I never thought about it. <laughs> whether I was an average player, whether I was a great player, whether I was a very good player. I was just having fun going out there on the football field. And the way Coriel excited people before a game, it was fun going to play him. You know, it was really fun. It was more fun than anything else. It wasn't drudgery. It was kind of like you wanted to go out there and participate. And then we were out there howling crowds. We always had that big crowds of San Diego and Coriel there. Because he was a, he was a, he was a, uh, he was a city. He was a city of fun, you know, back in those days. Korea was a deep person in San Diego, and I didn't. I didn't think it was George Dre. I just thought it was fun, and it was hard working, but it was fun, and you loved looking at Coriel on the sideline every Sunday. And Coriel, what he trained under was it Sid Gilman, I believe. Uh, I don't know. No, I don't know about that. No, he coached, Sid coached San Diego for a while too. Yeah, now see, you know, started, you know, he was from about 59 when they were all Los Angeles Chargers to 60, they became the San Diego Chargers. Now, Sid Gilmore was him in from, you know, from those years up to Pro Tour, I think, you know. He also had great offensive teams also, you know, last all work and all those guys. They were they had a great, great passing game. They had also Gary Garrison, Lance Allworth, Jock McKinnon. They did very well. But Sid Gilman, I don't know if Coriel and Sid Gilman crossed. Because I think the year that Sid was going to coach, the head coach of San Diego, Chargers, Don Coriel was coaching uh, the San Diego State Aztecs. Now, you never made it to a Super Bowl, but you did not get to a couple of uh, AFC title games in 80 and 81. Uh, right. Do you remember those yeah, games? Um... Yeah, I know one thing. One of them was against the Oakland Raiders. And uh, Oakland came in and he just ran the football and just ran it and just ran it and kept the ball away from the offense. The offense could not do anything because the Oakland just came and ran the ball, ran it, ran it. And then we went to Cincinnati to play in the Cold Bowl. Unfortunate, you know. <clears throat> we played the Raiders and it never rained in San Diego. It rained that Sunday. And it, it kind of shuts down the passing game because it makes it feel real slow. And then we go to the other AFC Championship game. We go to Cincinnati, and the wind chill factor is sixty below zero. And we just come from bad, bad climatic weather things. You know, they really kind of put a bite, kind of put a bite on us. You probably thought to yourself, "I got out of Cincinnati because I want to play in this weather, and now I get stuck in one of the coldest games in history." Oh, I know. It was, oh, it was unbelievable there. I still think that game should not have been played. The game should have been moved to a central site somewhere. We could have a better AFC championship game. That, but that football think, had to feel like a rock it, that day. It, it was a rock. It was like you're picking up a concrete ball. I don't know. I, I can't see how far it can ask for even trying to throw the football. But Cincinnati wasn't trying to throw it that much. But we had to go, we had to try to throw it because we got behind pretty quick. So we were trying to throw the football and there's no way you could throw that ball. No way. They should have canceled that game. How did you end up with number 18? 
I don't know. I kind I kind of changed the jersey number. I had I had jersey forty in Houston when I got drafted. And I think I had a jersey forty for about one year, and then I, and then uh, I became a defensive. I became a wide receiver, and I think all the eighties were gone. And next training camp, like the second year, all the eighties were gone. So I had to pick a number below eight. I had to pick a team and top pick eighteen. Is there a reason why Don Coyle's not in the Hall of Fame? I mean, this guy was an innovator, and they're still running these offenses to this day. This guy was probably the greatest offensive innovator around. I cannot, I cannot understand why he's not in the Hall of Fame. That's strictly up to the writers and the voters. You know, I think leave it at that because I think I've done as much as I possibly can. I've talked about it as much as I possibly can. I've written about it as much as I possibly can. It's up to the writers and the voters now. But I just don't understand why he's not in the Hall of Fame either. Now, when you retired, you had uh, a record 750 receptions for your career. Is, mm-hmm. is there one that's, that one catch that stands out in your mind? I think I think the thing the one reception that really stands out in my mind was basically the one that broke the record in Pittsburgh. I know it's a very short pass, but that, that, that period in my career. That, with short passes and uh, patrol passes, which down passes. And it just came on a what? Very short, third and third down situation. And I just have to catch, catch, catch the ball that broke the record. That what I do with a lot of the others I don't remember that much. I don't know if it's because I'm getting just a little over right now. Maybe I'm I don't know. I need something to do one that reached one that broke the record and that one. Then you won the coaching. A lot of great players, bad coaches, who worked with some receivers, some great receivers. I mean, I mean, the Bills, you had but James Lofton, you, you had Andre yeah. Reed, and then with the Jackson mm-hmm. Jackson and Mel Lloyd. I mean, was it easy to impart knowledge to them? I mean, with respect that because you were a great player, or did it, you basically have to earn their respect? Uh, I, think, I think you earn your respect, of course. And then I think you, just, you, you integrate the two, the two system, systems. You know, because they always have, they have ideas of how they want to perform. And then you, and then you put together your your idea of how you how you want them to perform. To perform. And then you just try to get, you try to find a find a common common where you can come you can communicate with these guys guys because because the communi- communication language language is, is totally different. When I played I played twenty six years six years ago and they playing mm-hmm. now you know you gotta get on get on that communication level first. first. And once you once you do that, that then coaching becomes fun. Then you integrate the two systems the way you want it done, the way he like would like to do it sometimes, and just integrate it and you have a good working relationship. How's the guy last eighteen seasons in the NFL as a wide receiver? I think it's from the necessity of knowing that there were three women in my house and women are very, very expensive. And I think it just needed to pay that many years to get over the house. Because my daughters and my wife were terribly expensive coming through. So I just kept playing, kept playing because I knew I would need the, the revenue later on so I can really complete their lives so they can do almost the thing, do most of the things that they wanted to do. Then it'd be enjoyable coaching with the Bills because, I mean, the Bills offense was similar to San Diego because Jim Kelly was running a pretty much a passing offense there, and he was audibling a lot and doing a lot of no huddle then, and the quarterback was similar to what Dan Fouts was doing with San Diego. Uh, yeah, the only difference between what we did and what Buffalo did is that uh, we actually called the plays, okay? Fouts did not call very many plays. He got the signals from the sideline, and that's the way he liked it. You know, he would like for Ernie to have the pressure of calling the plays or would have Ernie have the luxury of calling the plays. So he would execute them on the field. Now, if there's something that Ernie didn't call that he didn't like, he would definitely change it. But he, he was more receptive to being told to play from the sideline. Kelly did it in a whole fashion where he actually called every play. So he, he almost had to set his own game plan every week. He and Frank Wright did a great job of setting their game plan for the week. And which was pretty good. And they both offenses were very similar. They both had three wide receivers in the game most of the time. And they and they both had one great tight end who could also block 
the only same thing. They both had two great quarterbacks. So basically, that offense is almost the same. It's got to it in a different way, different language for the Korea offense, from the, to a different language to the, um, I forget that coach's name, was at Baltimore, that was his offense, the Kagan offense. Now, you retired in 86, and then you got elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 96. Mm-hmm. Were you confident that that day was going to come, or did, did you wonder? Oh, uh, no, I, I I always knew that when I was good. I knew you had to wait five years before you became eligible. And then you then it took me five more years to get in. But I knew that day was coming because um, I think uh, James Harris, my quarterback in college, he always would say, hey, Charlie, the record holders always go into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> and uh, I kept depending on that, depending on that. And I was like, you know, and, Hey, you know, it's hard to get your record all the out of Hall of Fame. Who, who do you think the next, next receiver that goes in the Hall of Fame will be? Well, I, you know, I tried to figure that out for the last, last two or three years. I think the next guy should be Andre Reed. I thought Andre Reed was a great wide receiver. I think he should be the next one to go in. Now, that's not totally up to me, and I understand that. But Andre Reed should be in the Hall of Fame. It's a Super Bowl if he went to. What he, to. What he did being a leading receiver for that team for most of those years. I just think I'm going to be next guy to go in. But I don't control the boat. I wish I did, but I don't. During your career, was there one defensive pass that gave you trouble? There were two of them, yeah. I always thought Will Brown was the best bumper on corner I ever faced, and he was, because he was a little bigger and a little stronger. And I always thought Mel Blunt of Pittsburgh was the best cover two corner. That ever played. Those two guys gave you hits. Because they were so big, they were a little bigger and they looked stronger than you are back in those days. Now, I don't know if they can handle the wide receivers today because the wide receivers up today are just a little bigger than we are. But they could handle the wide receivers back in the era. And those two guys gave me hits because they were bigger and they still had it around them. Well, what the receivers today don't understand is they're putting up these stats, it's a lot easier because. You you can't touch receiver after five yards. It's a lot less physical with the receivers. I mean, back when you were playing and the guys in the 50s and 60s, they would hold these guys. That's right. They could, they could hit you all the way down the field if they wanted to. I know the receivers are a little protected now, and uh, it's just to make the game just a little more exciting so you get the passing game that, uh, that incites the fans. Yes, you get it going a little bit more. But, uh, you know, if we didn't have some of that leeway back in the old days, I'm, you know, I'm going to call a thousand It's called catching this field in 50. What do you think of Randy Moss's comment that he's the best receiver that ever played? Um, <laughs> it's very good for a guy to feel that way. And, um, you know, he's extremely, in fact, he might be the most talented guy that ever played. I he's the best receiver that ever played. I don't think so. But he could be the most talented. Talent-wise, he might be. But just being a great football player and being a very good football player, he's not. So I just hate to take that the little trust away from him because I just don't think that he is the best receiver to ever play the game. There's too many other great players out there. I grant you he needs his credit and his due his credit. But there are some awful great other other great receivers out there. So I feel like yeah. How much of your success or how much of a wide receiver's success comes not from his physical skills? But from the neck up. I totally believe that if you don't have a halfway decent good IQ, that you would not be a very good football player. I think, and especially in today's game, because there's so many checks, there's so many automatic checks, not just for the wide receivers, but also for the quarterbacks. I just think you've got to know exactly what's going on to be a very good player in today's league. Back then, when the offense was not so loaded, you know, now you can, you, you see offense coordinators, they got a big sheet in front of them, and they could have about 200 plays on each side of that sheet. And that's a lot of stuff for a guy to remember. So a guy has really got to be almost told to know exactly what he's doing. He's got to study a little bit harder now. He's got to go home and uh, <clears throat> cut the nightlight, you know, cut his nightlight down just a little bit now because he's got to study what's going on. 
And that was Charlie Joyner, Pro Football Hall of Fame wide receiver who started his career as a defensive back and ended it as the guy with as the all-time leader in career receptions and receiving yards. Spent 44 years in the NFL, 18 of them as a player. Not bad. Not bad at all. You are listening to Sports and Torts on TalkZone.com, and when we come back, we hope to have bikini competitor Samantha Slavin, who I believe at this moment is unloading some of her trophies from her car to bring into the studio. So please stay tuned. Stay tuned. 